Turn your Bibles or turn them on to Exodus chapter 3. There's something we need to learn from this great book of Exodus today. We are going to learn that the voice we respond to determines the future that we experience. So I'm preaching today on the subject, I wish I could, but I can't. I wish I could, but I can't. Hello, Eric family. Hi, Lizzie. Hi, guys. Good to have you up front for a change. This is nice. I wish I could, but I can't. This, this message really has a lot to say about insecurities. I want to address the feelings that insecurities create and see if maybe you can identify with them because I believe it's those feelings uh, in many cases that keep us from being wholeheartedly committed to God and the purpose of the church. I want Sammy to um, put a phrase up on the screen and I want you to read it with me. Do we have it, Sammy? I am never blank enough. I'm never blank enough. How, how many have ever had a thought like that? I am never something enough. Yeah, m- most of you have at some point or another. If you're like me, that, that sentiment can change from moment to moment. It can change with a phone call or a conversation. I want you to know that I relate to this sentiment. Now, I want you to help me fill in the blank real quick. Um, let Let me start. I'll make it easy for you. I am never qualified enough. That's... That's mine. That's my number one, I think. I always have that sense about me where I never really feel qualified to be a pastor. As a matter of fact, there have been times in my ministry that I felt like I probably shouldn't be pastoring. I should just go to church somewhere and be a faithful participant, maybe sing a special every once in a while and and then go home. I am never able enough. That's one that really troubles me. I never get around everything that I want to do. My goals for myself and and for this church are lofty, and, and there's a lot of them. And because of that, I seem to never be able to get to all of the things that I want to see for myself even and for this church. I'm not able enough. I'm not qualified enough. Now, I need to hear from you because I want to know how messed up you are. So I am never good enough. Yeah, just throw out some words. Come on. I am never, say it loud. I am never, come on, we're not going until we have a conversation. I'm never organized enough. Sammy's never tall enough. Never thin enough. Yeah, that's Josh's, my nephew's problem too. I'm never, there's always something, isn't there? I want you to think about that because that sentiment is what we're going to deal with today because it is that sense of insecurity. I believe that is the essence of most insecurities that we have, most things that trouble us, and it's, it's, it's that feeling that tends to keep us, I believe, at least from being everything that God has purposed for our lives to be. God is wanting to do great things. You need to know God is wanting to do great things in you. God wants to do the miraculous in you. He wants to take you to a place you've never been before. He wants you to see things you've never seen. He wants to do through you in a way that you've never experienced. And then corporately as a church, He wants the same thing for Christ first. You know, we're nine years old today. And God has a great year ahead of us. 
And not only the next year, but the following after that and after that. God has a purpose for this church, something that he wants to do. So in order to be all that God has called us to be, to minister in a way that's effective and fruitful, purposeful, we need to shake free from some of these insecurities that cripple us in the call that God has placed on our life. I am never blank enough. We're going to look at three specific things in the life of Moses that I believe you and I can relate to. I believe all three of these things will be relatable to you, will resonate in you as we look at this. So I want us to read from God's holy word together, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. We're going to skip around Exodus 2, 3, and 4 uh, today. So we're going to read some verses, and then I'll give back story to where we are, and hopefully we'll get through this in a timely manner. Hey, the good news is you don't have to go stand in line to eat. You can stand in line here and eat, right? So everything's going to be perfect. Read with me in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 3. The Bible says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. How many is familiar with this story? Okay, a few of you are. Good. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses saw, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached to me, and I have seen the way of the Egyptians, and the way they're being oppressed. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. <laughs> That's a great passage, isn't it? God is speaking through this burning bush to a man who did not expect to hear from God. God is calling him by name, not once but twice. He calls out to him, Moses, Moses, he says. In Scripture, that's known as a double inclusive when a name is mentioned twice. It's sort of an exclamation point, and it means I'm, I've got something very important to tell you, and you need to listen. You need to drop everything. You need to stop right now and listen to what I'm about to say. You so, so God called to Moses in this very extraordinary way. Moses, Moses, you need to listen to what I'm going to tell you. And he laid out this plan to deliver the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And he said, Moses, I'm going to use you to deliver my children. Now look at verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? <laughs> In this passage, it seems that there's two characters carrying on a conversation. We have Moses and who else? God, Moses and God. Or at least that's what seems to be happening. But I want to suggest to you that there's another person speaking. He's not mentioned, but I believe he's there. It's, it's that voice in you that says, you're not able. You're not good enough. 
You're not who everyone thinks you are. It's that voice inside of you that's always condemning you, always pointing out your flaws and reminding you of your failures. It's Satan who is speaking. He's not mentioned by name here in these verses, but certainly we can hear in the responses of Moses that someone else is speaking to him. I mean, put yourself in Moses' place for a moment. He's out and he's just tending the sheep. He's, He's a shepherd at this point. He's tending the sheep of Jethro, his father-in-law. Moses has a past. He's running from it. We're going to find out in just a moment. He's done some things. Some bad things have happened. And he's done some bad things to other people. And now he's just hiding. He meets a woman. He marries. And he thinks, I'll just go out into the fields. I'll keep sheep. And nobody will know where I am. And then God calls to him. How cool is this story? I mean, here Moses is, and and he walks by a bush. We don't have a complete picture of what happened. Did he just walk by and poof, it it came on? (laughs) Or was it already burning, and he tops over a hill, and he just sees it? At some point, he recognizes that this bush is burning, but it's not burning up. And that's weird. And and so the weird enticed Moses, and he said, I'm going to go see what's happening. And he starts walking over, and as we saw in the verses, God calls out to him and stops him in his tracks. God Almighty is speaking to Moses. And he shares with with him this incredible opportunity. I mean, what if God spoke to you today? What if, what if God said to you before this service is over, hey, Dave, I want to do something great through you, man. There's something going on, and I want you to be part of it. And here's what I'm going to do. And he just laid it out. What if he said to someone else, hey, there's some things happening today that I'm not pleased with, and I need a man or a woman who will stand up, stand in the gap for people, pray and do what I've asked them to do. And what if he called you by name and said, you're the man, you're the woman? What would you think? What would you do? You have a choice at that point. You can say, yes, Lord, I'll do anything that I can. Or you can do as Moses did. Here, look at verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Wow. God said, I am God. He spoke to Moses and said, I am God. And maybe Moses just had an instinctive response when he said, who am I? But I think there's more to it than that. I think someone is whispering in his ear. And so Moses said, no, God, I wish I could, but I can't. God says, no, this is what I want you to do. And and Moses says, no, to God. (laughs) Have you ever done that? Might as well be honest, because God already knows. You ever said no to God? God says, here's what I want you to do. Hey, God says, You know that person standing in front of you in the grocery checkout line? They're having a bad day and they need to be encouraged. I want you to speak to them and tell them about me. No, God. I wish I could, but I can't. You ever had that happen? That's what Moses said. And look what drives Moses to his response. Think in this term. Number one, I'm so dysfunctional. I'm so dysfunctional. This is what I believe Satan was whispering in the ear of Moses. And I believe I can believe I'm can be certain about that because of scripture. Look at verse 11 through 15 of Exodus chapter 2. One day after Moses had grown up, 
he went out to where his own people were and watched them at hard labor. Now, you, re- you remember the story of Moses, right? You, re- you remember? He was born during a time that Pharaoh was killing all the baby boys. Pharaoh felt like the Israelites were being blessed and prospered too much. Although they were slaves in Egypt, he said, I can't have any more Israelite men being born. There's too many of them. They'll take us over. So he orders, Pharaoh orders that all the male children, when they were born, to be thrown into the Nile River. And and Moses was born during that time. His mother, named Jochebed, hid Moses. She saw that when Moses was born, he was special. Now, we don't know exactly what that means. We know that the word means, in the Hebrew, beautiful. Maybe he was just this incredibly beautiful baby. As a matter of fact, everywhere we read of Moses in the Old Testament, when he was a child, when it refers to him as a child, it says he was beautiful. He was special. So Jochebed says, I can't throw this kid in the Nile River. There's no way. And so the Bible teaches us that she hid him for three months. She hid him. It's hard to hide a baby. Right? Three months. They cry. They make a lot of noises. They make a lot of smells. It's hard to hide a baby. But he was hid. And then you know the rest of the story. Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile River. Jockey bed after three months. Puts him in a little bull rush. This little basket. And she floats him out into the Nile River. Pharaoh's daughter comes down to bathe and she sees Moses. She opens up the basket. Her heart is stolen and she takes him to the palace. And Moses is raised in the palace. And the Bible says here in verse 11 of Exodus 2, when he was grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that. And seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and then hid him in the sand. He buried him. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. And he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me also? Like you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I have done must have become known. And when Pharaoh heard of this, He tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. Now, it's many, many years later. Moses is married. He's keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. He sees this bush burning and God calls to him and God says, "I've, I've got something for you to do. And the voice in Moses' head says to him, you can't do that. You're a murderer. You, you can't do anything for God. You can't be used by God. You're so dysfunctional. Your life is a mess. He was raised during a time that those born in his day were killed. He kills a man himself. Now he's running for his life, and God says, you're the man. You're the one I want to use. And Moses hears another voice that says, you can't do that because you're dysfunctional. And Moses responds, no, Lord, I wish I could, but I can't. Have you ever told God, Lord, I wish I could, but I can't. I can't do that. I wish I could, but I can't. I'm I'm so dysfunctional. God, you don't know everything there is to know about me. If you knew who I really was, God, you wouldn't ask me to do that. But God answers with a resounding, I know you best. And I love you most. No, God, I wish I could, but I can't. I'm so dysfunctional. Number two, I'm so deficient. Deficient means lacking something that's needed, not having enough of something. I'm never skilled enough. I'm I'm never talented enough. 
I'm never decisive enough. I'm always lacking. I'm just lacking, lacking. I want you to turn your Bible to Exodus 4, verse 10. While you're turning there, let me give you the backstory because we skipped a lot of verses. There's this, this long conversation taking place with Moses and God. God is telling him what he wants him to do, what he wants to accomplish in his life. And Moses is going, no, God, I can't do that. I wish I could, but I can't. You've got the wrong person, God. Finally, Moses blurts out, if, if I should go, who would I even tell the Israelites that has sent me? Who would I tell them sent me? And, and God said, I am What was that, God? I got the first part of that, but I must have missed something. What else? did You must have broke up. What did you say? I am. Well, yeah, I got that, God. You are. You, 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 are, you are what, God? I am who I am. I am that I am. I am. Then God says, if, if the rest of the Israelites were as slow as you, tell them that the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent you. No. God, I wish I could, God, but I can't. And God said, what, you, what are you holding in your hand? Moses looks and he says, it's just a shepherd's staff, really just a stick. That's all it is. And, and, and God told Moses, throw it down. Now, how many believes that God has a sense of humor in this place? Guarantee you God has a sense of humor. And that's what we're seeing. Right. So, so Moses throws down the stick. I have to believe that Moses is more scared of a snake than I am. And when he throws down the stick, the Bible says that God turned it into a snake. And then he does something even more crazy. He tells Moses, reach down and pick it up by the tail. Okay. At that point, you just got to retreat and go, no, you got to be kidding me. But this conversation with Moses is, is building something up in him. I mean, Moses is talking to God. And anytime we know this to be true, anytime we get in proximity to God, our faith begins to grow, doesn't it? It takes a moment. I, I get that. Sometimes me and God, we're talking all the time. And, and little by little, I'm growing. So he tells Moses, pick that, that snake up by the tail. Moses reaches down and picks it up. And the Bible says it turns back into a, into a stick. <laughs> That's really great. Then God said, put your hand in your bosom. He does that. And he pulls it out and it's leprous. He quickly sticks it back in. When he pulls it back out, it's normal again. And God tells Moses, that should be enough. They should listen, but just in case they don't. Take a bucket and dip it in the Nile River. And when you pour it out on the ground, the water will become blood. And then they will bleed. This long conversation, God trying to convince Moses. But then look what Moses said in, in Exodus 4.10. We could say but here. But Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. Forgive me. But I've never been eloquent. Neither in the past. And then he says this, Nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. So Moses is saying, God, you, you know I'm deficient in speech, right? And nothing has changed since you and I have been speaking. I mean, the this, this, this stick turned into a snake, and that was really cool. That hand thing, God, that scared me, but all back to normal. That's great, God. But nothing has changed this. You, you forgot about this, God. I still can't speak plain. You must have the wrong person. I'm, I'm deficient. God, I'm dysfunctional. 
You don't need me. You can't use me. I'm deficient. I'm not the one. You certainly have someone better than me. Then God answers him in verse 11 and 12. The Lord said, Who gave human beings their mouths? You ever tried to argue with God? Oh, that's the biggest waste of time. You'll never win an argument with God. You're going to bring up your past, but He already knows your future. You're going to talk about how deficient you are, but He's going to tell you He's all sufficient. You can't win an argument with God. And here's Moses trying to say to him, Lord, I can't. I'm deficient. But God says, who gives human beings their mouths? Wow. What is the thing? Listen, let me ask you this question. Be honest with yourself. If you're you're taking notes, you write the answer down. What is the thing that you always bring up to God? As an excuse. Most of us have something. Lord, I'm too busy. I would. God, I wish I could, but I can't. I'm too busy. I'm taking care of 78 people. You know, I got all these people that rely on me, God. I can't. I wish I could, but I can't. Lord, my health is is failing me. I I wish I could, but I can't. Listen, if God calls you, He knows you're capable. That's not in and of yourself, but that's through Him. What is it that you always bring up to God? Have you ever thought about this? That when you doubt a product, You insult the manufacturer. Have you ever thought about that? Did you know that your insecurity is an insult to God? When God calls you to do something and you look at Him and say, I am so deficient in that area, you are saying to God, You blew it. Wow. Moses runs out of arguments. Everything that he says, God shoots down. I'm dysfunctional God. I come from a broken family. I was raised by Egyptians. I killed a man, God. Can you really use someone who has killed someone else? I'm so so deficient. I, I can't speak. And God, every time Moses gives an excuse, God gives a response and he's running out of things to say. So he goes to one last place. He says, God, I'm so doubtful. Look at verse 13. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. He just, he just finally gives in and says, God, I, I know that nothing I can say will matter because I know you have all the answers. But I just I don't want to do this. Could you please send someone else? Could you please just send, no more excuses, God, just send someone else. What we're seeing here is a man wrestle with fundamental insecurities. When charged with probably the largest task that could have been asked of him in that time. We're watching him come to the end of himself. He's assessing himself. He's arguing with God and he comes up short. And notice what happens. Verse 14, then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. I can't, I I would like to, God, but I can't. I would, 
I wish I could, but I can't. And, and the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. And God said, what about your brother? Aaron, the Levite. I know he can speak well. And he's already on his way to meet you. And he'll be glad to see you. Now, we don't even know how big that verse is. I mean, God has gone to Aaron and spoke to him too. Okay, I'm trying to call your knucklehead brother to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he's being hard to deal with. I need you to go over and talk to him. And here's what's going to happen. He's already spoke to Aaron and he says, he says to Moses, Aaron is already on his way. He's coming. And he'll be glad to see you. You will speak to him. Put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you. It will be as if he were your mouth. And as if you were God to him. But take that stick in your hand and perform all those signs I told you to. Wow. See, see, there's a, there's a big, big part of me that feels sorry for, for Moses because the doubts that I see in him resonate in me. I can't tell you how many times I've had a similar conversation Oh, it was about different things. I'm not delivering the children of Israel out of 400 years of slavery, but he's asked me or called me, commanded me to do things, and I'm giving him every excuse in the book. I've been there. I know what Moses is going through. So there's a part of me that really feels sorry for him. But God, layer by layer, as if peeling an onion will just take away every excuse. You have some of you in this place have argued with God over and over again, time and time again, because God has said to you, I've got great things for you. I know your life is not what you thought it would be. I know you think it's dysfunctional. I know you think you're deficient. I know you think things shouldn't be this way. But I've already had a plan for you. It's been in place since before the foundation of the world. And nothing, nothing is impossible with me. And he's wanting to do something great and awesome in your life. And some of you are just like Moses. The man, you're tenacious. You're not giving up. Oh, I wish I could, God, but I can't. Until finally, God just pulls the rug out from under you. And he says, okay, enough's enough. Here's how we're going to do it. Sometimes God just stops the argument and says, okay, forget about the fact that you and I are having a conversation. From now on, you're not talking. I'm talking, you're listening. And he pulls the rug out from under us. Everything that we thought, every good argument we thought we had, God says, no, 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 we're done. Now, I've never been a parent, but a lot of you are. And, 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 and I've seen some of you interact with your children, and I've seen you be patient for a while. You know, I mean, those kids, uh, you know, they, they've got their thing, and you love them all. They're so precious. Smartest kids in the world. I know, I get all that. But, but after a while of going back and forth, finally, you just go, no, no, no. Enough's enough. Because I said so, that's why. How many's ever gone to that place? Because I said so, that's why. <laughs> We're not talking about this anymore. God has a way of doing that. He just, after a while, says, okay. You, you, you made your case. Now let me tell you what we're going to do. And when God does that, you need to realize there is a purpose bigger than your person. You think everything revolves around you. And you can't do this because of this, or I've got this going on, and this is happening. Everything. You think everything revolves around you, and God's going, no, it don't. No, it don't revolve. Nothing revolves around you. Everything revolves around me. And if I tell you you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Or you're going to pay the price. Listen, God don't play. I mean, have you read the Bible? 
I mean, we know that God is merciful. Oh, he's, he's full of grace. He's merciful. Thank God for that because if he wasn't, none of us would be in this place today. He had already killed a lot of us. If God wasn't graceful and merciful, oh my goodness, I wouldn't have lived to been three. But God is graceful. He is merciful. He does love me. And he loves you. But God has a purpose and a plan, not only for your life, but for this world. And he has plugged us in. And he depends on us. Some of you act as if God does not want you or depending or does not depend on you to do anything for him. You're wrong about that. God has a plan for every person's life, a purpose that's bigger than you. And you need to capitulate to what God is wanting to do in your life. Quit thinking that everything revolves around you and that I'll do it if, it's, if it was more convenient, God. If, if, if I could, I would, but I can't. Quit acting as if that's even an argument to God. God is going, listen, before you were born, before the foundation of the world, I mapped all this out. It's perfect. You need to get involved. You need to plug in right here. I'm so dysfunctional. I'm so deficient. I'm so doubtful. You know what is amazing? I'm going to close real quick right here, but What's amazing to me, and, and, and the reason I believe that Moses is such an example in Scripture, and he is the person he is in history. Through all of this conversation over these chapters, we never once see Moses doubt God and his ability to deliver the children of Israel. Moses doesn't doubt God. Moses is doubting himself. God, I know you're able. Oh, God, I know you can do that. Oh, yeah, you, you can take care of Egypt. That's no problem for you, God. I know you can deliver the children of Israel, but I can't. See, see Moses never doubted God, but he doubted himself. And I think that a lot of preachers miss that. I think a lot of Bible studies miss that because we hear... We hear a lot of sermons addressing the fact that you got to believe more. If you just trust God more. You ever had anyone tell you that? If you just trust God more. God is a, we, we love those sermons. God is able. Nothing wrong with that. Theology is correct there. But you can misappropriate it if you're not careful. God is able. God is able. But most of us know that God is able. I don't doubt that God can do anything he wants to do. But I do doubt what he's able to do through me sometimes. I do doubt myself. We just don't hear many sermons on that. Remember when God told Moses his name? He said, I am. Theologians refer to that as the isness of God. It's talking about the present tenseness of God. See, see, God told Moses finally, tell them I said I'm the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of the past. But the name of God is in the present tense. I am. God is not only the God of the past. He is also the God of 2021. He's the God of today. He's the God of the right now. now I don't know what's going on in your life right now. Now some of you I do because we, we talk and we, we pray together and I know that you're going through a lot of stuff. But God is, you need to know that God is not just the God of Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God is the God of Gala. The God of Kim. The God of Kathy. God of Tim, 
the God of PJ. God is the God of now. He is I am. I am. Truth be known, some of you are here today out of obligation. You didn't really want to come. But you're here out of a sense of obligation. Maybe I gave you a personal invitation. Just said, man, I wish you'd come. But God is telling you today, I, I believe He's telling you, listen, I am, I am, I am your God. And I want to work through you. I have a purpose for you, a plan for your life. Are you willing to follow me? And you have the choice right now in this room. You have the choice to say yes to God or I wish I could, but I can't. Mary, come and play. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to take a good look inside your heart and in your mind. Then I want you to repeat that phrase that you thought of a moment ago. I'm never blank enough. That voice is very easy to hear, isn't it? You, you, you know why I think we, we fall for that so often? As a matter of fact, look up here just for a moment. Because I, I, I want to I talk to you and look you in the eye. You know the reason I think we fall for that? I'm so dysfunctional. I'm so this. I'm so that. You know why we fall for that? I believe, I believe we fall for it because Satan is always speaking to us in the first person. If he was speaking to us in the second person, you do this, you do that, you're so dysfunctional. We would have the ability to argue. That's our nature, right? So if somebody says, you know, to me, and it happens a lot, you're a bonehead. never proved anybody wrong but I'll argue the point point. And, and if Satan came to you in the second person you are you are just because of our nature we'd argue but he doesn't do that Satan's really smart he's wise at what he does he comes to us in the first person and he makes us think it's our own thoughts I am dysfunctional I am deficient I am doubtful and we can't argue with ourselves and we fail to realize that that third voice isn't us but it's the deceiver it's the liar it's Satan that's wanting to destroy us God is saying I want to do something great in your life Listen, I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity of a lifetime. You're going to do great things. I'm going to work in you. And then we hear a voice that we think is ours. And we say, I wish I could, but I can't. And God is going, listen, you have to listen to me. You have to listen to me. And the voice you listen to today will determine your experience tomorrow. For some of you, the only problem you're having right now is that you're just listening to the wrong voice. God is speaking to you right now. He's speaking to a lot of you right now going, listen, I've got something great for you and I'm, I want to do something great in your life. He's saying to you, you are special. You are good. I don't make junk. You are who I say you are. And 
and I say, you are redeemed. Don't listen to the other guy. When we start listening to the right voices, all of a sudden God starts doing the miraculous in us. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Listen, are you going to let God do something in your life today? Okay, I want you to bow your head. I'm going to pray right now, and I'm going to ask you to do something scary. You remember? God asked us to do scary things. He turned that stick into a snake and then told Moses, reach down and grab it by the tail. That's scary. I'm going to ask you to do something scary. I'm going to ask you to respond to God. I'm going to ask you to come here and pray as a show to everyone else that, hey, today I'm making a decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I've been listening to the wrong voice. And today I recognize the fact that I've been listening to the wrong voice and I'm going to change that. I'm going to listen to the right voice. That's what I want. no magic right down here, but I'm going to ask you to come forward and stand here and pray just that Satan can know. Uh Uh-oh. She gets it. Uh Uh-oh. He gets it. Uh Uh-oh. I thought I had her deceived. And now she knows the truth. Listen, there is something to taking a public stand for God you need to do that today. I'm going to ask you to listen to the right voice. This is between you and him. Father, I want to thank you for who you are. You're an awesome God, worthy to be praised. Lord, we love you. And thank you for your spirit that is in this place today. You're speaking to hearts, and Satan hates it. Oh, my goodness. He is he's speaking a lot of filth and lies to a lot of people right now. No, 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 no. He's not talking about you. No, no, you know you're all right. No, no. He's speaking a lot of of lies. He's a liar and the father of it. Your word tells us that. Your word is truth. And you are speaking truth to people right now in this place. You are speaking truth to people right now. I pray, God, that you have your way on earth in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you just stand to your feet. Listen, I don't know, I don't know your heart, the condition of your heart, so I want to share with you real quickly that God loves you and that he gave his son for you. Jesus, the son of God, died on a cross for you, for your sins. The Bible tells us for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes every man, woman, boy, and girl in the world that has reached the age of knowing right from wrong. It just happens. We live in a fallen world. We're all descendants from Adam and Eve. They fell in the garden. We are fallen people. We've all sinned. And the wages of sin is death, it says. Meaning, if we got what we deserved... We would die because of our sin. That's ominous, isn't it? But John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He didn't like the state that we were in. So God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God says, I don't want you to die. I don't, I don't want you to say, I love you. For God so loved the world, I love you. And I don't want you to die. So he sent his son Jesus. And Jesus died in our place. He literally died in our place. Yeah. And the Bible tells us in Romans with a heart... Man believes in that finished work of Jesus Christ. But with a heart, man believes unto righteousness. And with a mouth, confession is made 
unto salvation. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can do that right now. You can say, Jesus, I know you gave your life for me. And I believe that. I believe that you came and that you died. The Bible tells us that on the third day, he got up out of the grave. He rose from the grave. And he's alive today. And you can pray and say, I know that you died for my sins. And I accept you as my atonement for sin. I know that's a theological word, but you can just basically say, Lord, I believe in what you've done and I'm thankful and I want to be a follower of Christ. Will you come into my heart and save me? You do that and all of heaven will break out into a party. Did you know that? The Bible says that more angels rejoice over one who comes to know Jesus as their Savior the 99 it needs no repentance man they're on the edge of their seat a party's about to happen and they're just waiting on you to respond would you come today Father I've preached as best I can your word I had no desire to preach opinion or conjecture when I stood here this morning I wanted to preach your word your word changes lives the truth sets us free and the only truth in this world is your word so Lord I pray today that you'll have your finished work I give you praise in Jesus name Amen. thank you for watching with us today I hope God has spoken to your heart if he has I pray that today you will give your heart and life to him if God has done something great in you if he's revealed something to you please before you log off today go to the comment section in our Facebook Live and let us know that God has done a work in your life. Will you do that? I want to rejoice with you. If you'd like for me to reach out to you with resources to help you in your walk with Christ, we would love to do that. Thank you for being part of our worship experience. I pray you have a great day.